Amen. Well, we are continuing in our series through Matthew's gospel. And this morning we begin chapter 13. So Matthew 13, starting in verse 1. Let's go ahead and read the opening here. Matthew says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him. So that he got into a boat and he sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Okay, so now this is often referred to as the parable of the sower. And this parable is actually the first of eight different parables that Jesus tells the crowds and the disciples all here in chapter 13. So here we are into this new chapter and it's filled with these parables. And Jesus used many, many parables in his teachings. And so when we read through the gospels, we run across a lot of them as we will over the next number of weeks here in chapter 13. And so it's important for us to understand what is a parable and what isn't a parable. That Greek word behind parable, it it carries with it this idea of laying beside or or laying alongside. And the idea is that this is a literary device or a storytelling device where someone lays a very simple everyday idea alongside a more complex idea. Again, it's something Jesus does a lot. And he uses these simple everyday situations to describe spiritual truths about the kingdom of heaven. He's describing the kingdom. And sometimes those parables, they take the form of a story or or a narrative. So for example, maybe you're familiar with like the parable of the prodigal son. Remember that story? It's a story about a a father and his two sons. Or, Or the parable of the good Samaritan. It's that story about someone who's in need and people who ignore the person in need, except for this one Samaritan who does good. Or the parable of the sower, like we just read right there at the beginning of chapter 13. Again, these are stories. But sometimes parables are a lot simpler. They're they're not full-blown stories. Sometimes they contain what are are called similes, where, where they compare, again, simple and complex things to illustrate that more complex thing. We're going to see a lot of this in chapter 13, where, where Jesus will on multiple occasions say, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he goes on. And so parables are these really commonly used rhetorical devices. In fact, Jesus didn't invent parables. These were around. You can find parables in the Old Testament. These were incredibly common in, Gre- in the Greco-Roman world, even hundreds of years before Jesus's life. So, so Jesus didn't invent them, but, but he used them a lot in his teaching. And the question comes up now in his teaching ministry, why did he use them? Like, like what was the purpose? Why did Jesus use parables in his teachings? Like, if you thought about that question, how would you, how would you answer that? I think most often we might say, well, I mean, because Jesus was a master teacher, right? And and that's true. Jesus was a great teacher, the the best even. And so he used parables, we might say, to, to make his point stick, so to speak, Because we know that illustrations and storytelling, those are powerful techniques for communication. In fact, in Bible college or in seminary, when you take a preaching class or you read a textbook on preaching, the use of illustrations or or the use of stories is is commonly encouraged because it's a rhetorical device. It's helpful for good communication because we know that just spitting facts out for, you know, 30 to 40 minutes is difficult to retain all of that, right? It isn't always easy to digest. It's not easy to retain all of that information. And stories help us remember a point better. And stories help influence its listeners. 
In fact, if you're familiar, even in the the uh, secular world of leadership, storytelling is is a really big uh, subject because uh, leaders understand they they need to inspire and influence their employees or or their stakeholders. So storytelling is a, a common practice even there. And so it's easy to read the Gospels and think, okay, here's Jesus. Here's the king who, who came to bring a message to the world about the kingdom of God and the world's need to repent and believe so that they can enter into the kingdom of God and think, well, of course Jesus used stories. I mean, he's trying to make the truths of the kingdom easier to understand. That's what master storytellers do. And that is partly true about Jesus. Jesus. Because here's what happens. After the parable of the sower that we just read here at the beginning of chapter 13, the disciples actually interject. Kind of a side conversation with Jesus, and and they're saying, we're confused. Like, like why are you using parables? To them, it doesn't make sense. And so they ask, Jesus, why are you teaching in this way? And Jesus' answer to the disciples here. It reveals something really important, not just about parables and not just about the kingdom of God. Jesus' answer actually reveals something very important about our hearts. And it reveals a lot about the gracious work of God in our hearts. And so here's what we're going to do. As we walk into chapter 13, next week we're actually going to walk through the parable of the sower that we just looked at. But this morning, what I want us to do is look at this next section, this section that's stuck right in the middle of the parable of the sower, starting in verse 10, when the disciples say, Jesus, I I don't get it. Why, Why are you teaching this way? And Jesus answers them. It's important for us to understand these per, the purpose of parables. And so we're going to do that this morning. It kind of lays the foundation for the next several weeks as we read parable after parable after parable after parable in chapter 13. Okay, so let's go ahead and pick it back up in verse 10. Jesus has just given the parable of the sower. Matthew records, Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you... It has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see. And hearing, they do not hear. Nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So again, here's the context. Jesus has drawn a crowd. They've gathered around. They want to hear. They're intrigued. And he gives them a parable. And again, the disciples seemingly say, Jesus, what are you doing? This doesn't make sense to us. Why are you teaching this way? In other words, why aren't you being more plain here? And Jesus' answer is perhaps surprising because Jesus says, here's why. Here's why I teach in a parable. The point of parables is both to reveal the truths of the kingdom of God and to conceal the truths of the kingdom of God. They have a dual purpose here. And in so doing, those parables really serve to reveal the condition of our hearts. That they help reveal whether or not we are a true disciple of the kingdom. That's what he says to his disciples. So there's, again, a lot to unpack in this section. But but the bulk of Jesus' teaching in in this passage here has to do with those listeners who are not disciples of Jesus. And Jesus says, those who are not his disciples, he's explaining to the disciples there, those who are not disciples of mine, they have a a sensory malfunction, spiritually speaking. In other words, they have ears, 
but they can't hear. They have eyes, but, but they don't see. And, and Jesus says the part of the purpose of these parables is not to make it clearer, but actually to conceal the truth further in judgment. And that's a lot, a lot to take in. Uh, but, but here's Jesus, and, and what he does to kind of support this, and this is really important, is he quotes from the Old Testament from the prophet Isaiah. Now, when you're reading the New Testament, and there's a quote from the Old Testament, I know it's a little bit of work, but it's really important to understand the context of that verse because it's really important to the context of the New Testament that uses that. And so we need to grasp what's happening here. He only quotes Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, but I want to see all of chapter 6 just to grasp the weight of this quote. Isaiah 6, if you're not familiar with this scene, Isaiah, the the prophet of God, he describes this incredible life-changing encounter he has with the Lord. Okay, so here's how he describes it. This is chapter 6, verse 1. Isaiah says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, these angels. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. So Isaiah says, I I had this incredible vision of the throne of God where he sees the all-holy, almighty God surrounded by angels singing his praise. Now, obviously, we can't even begin to imagine the weight of that vision, but, but needless to say, it has an impact on Isaiah. In fact, go, going on, he says in verse 5, And I said, Woe is me, for I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So again, Isaiah sees God in his glory and he instantly recognizes how unworthy he is to be there. And in this act of repentance, he just acknowledges his uncleanness and his sin and guilt are removed in this dramatic fashion by the seraphim. Again, life-changing for the prophet. But this encounter that Isaiah has with the Lord has, uh, leads him to, to more than just kind of a change in his own personal life. It has these kind of external implications. So going on in verse 8, uh, Isaiah says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. In other words, God has this mission. He has this task. And even though God already knows the answer to this question, right? He says, man, who who could we send on this mission? Who could we send on the task? And Isaiah enthusiastically says, hey, that's me. I'm in. I'm your guy. Send me. I, you just tell me where to go. You just tell me what to say. And, and I'm going to make it happen. Now, if you've been around the church uh, for any length of time, you've probably heard that ver- verse used many times um, to kind of promote missions involvement, right? Like, here I am, send me. And, and for good reason, right? We know God wants laborers in his harvest. He has a mission. He has a message to get out. We're praying that he would send more people. And some say to the Lord, here I am, send me. Just like Isaiah does. But the context of Isaiah 6 isn't exactly kind of what we have in mind when we send missionaries out. Because listen to the Lord's instruction to Isaiah in verse 9. So he says, here am I, send me. Verse 9, and God said, go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And then I, Isaiah said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitants. And houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. 
And the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again. Like a terebinth or, or an oak whose stump remains when it's felled, the holy seed is its stump. So like notice the scene here. God says, great, Isaiah, you're in. All right, here's your task. You're going to go to a people who don't want to hear from me, which means they don't want to hear from you. In fact, your mission, the task I'm sending you on, is to preach so that their hearts become even duller. And Isaiah's like, um, okay, like, like for how long? How, how long is this task going to last? And God says, well, until judgment comes. This is what I have for you. But like, Imagine that missionary call. That, like, that's so deflating if you're Isaiah, right? I mean, no missionary wants to go and face rejection. The great joy of sharing the gospel is, is seeing lives change for the good, isn't it? I mean, people repenting of their sin, and lives being restored by the power of the gospel, new communities of faith being established through church planning. But God tells Isaiah, no, I'm sending you with a message that will be ignored and even hated. This is your task. All right now, go back to Matthew 13, our text this morning. Here's Jesus, and he tells his disciples, this is why I'm speaking in parables. Because just like in Isaiah's day, these people's hearts are dull. Their ears are stopped up. Their ears are blind, spiritually, eyes are blind, spiritually speaking. And so we conceal the truth even more. In fact, notice what he says again, again in verse 14. He says to them, indeed, their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. That says you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you'll indeed see, but never perceive. Jesus says, this is fulfilled right now. Everything you read about in Isaiah 6 is coming to its completion here in my life and ministry. The idea here is that, yeah, Israel's heart was hardened. Their eyes were blind. Their ears were stopped as the Lord gave messages through his prophets. But now Jesus is here. I mean, God in the flesh, the true, the ultimate prophet, the one who no longer is saying, thus says the Lord, but, but now can say, no, I say unto you. And yet they still reject him. They still stop their ears. They close their eyes and they harden their hearts. I mean, again, Jesus is the peak of God's revelation to man and the people don't listen. In fact, in, in John's gospel, he actually says, Isaiah, in that throne room, when he sees the Lord, he sees Jesus. And now Jesus is here, and everything that Isaiah heard and experienced is fulfilled, again, in the earthly life and ministry of Jesus. And Jesus says, this is why I'm speaking in parables. Because hearts are dull. Eyes are closed, and ears are stopped up. Partially, it's an act of judgment. So again, a major purpose of parables is, again, to reveal that condition. But they even further that condition as a means of judgment on those who've rejected Jesus. And really, that's just what's so unique about these stories. For some, they are illuminating, right? Like they really do help us see these incredible truths about God and the kingdom and salvation and the gospel. For others, they reveal hardened hearts. For others, they reveal a continual rejection and even hardens them further, Jesus says. And again, really, this isn't that crazy to imagine because, again, we see this all the time, don't we? I mean, the same gospel story that has changed so many hearts, I mean, so many hearts in this room right now have been changed by the same message, the same message that, that has changed millions and millions of hearts all around the world that gather for worship today. It's the same story that far more people ignore or even despise. It's the same message. And so a, a person's response to the gospel message is the clearest indicator, of course, of their heart. But parables also serve as an indicator of our spiritual condition. In fact, it's been said that parables are, are like a thermometer of our spiritual condition. Parables are stories that, that actually read us. And so as we walk through these, this chapter, we're, again, just reminded of this relationship between our heads and our hearts. And this is really important for us because I think it's, it's very tempting to, to just think, you know, all a person needs to repent and believe is to know the gospel better. Or to know the Bible better. Or to know theological truths better. Better. 
Like if only they knew more, then they would obviously become a Christian. And to be sure, we want people to grow in in their knowledge of all of those things, right? Uh, After all, Paul says, how can someone believe in Jesus if they haven't heard of him? The gospel is a message. It needs to be communicated as clearly as possible. Every single one of us should strive to grow in our ability to communicate the gospel better. But but we shouldn't believe that, that that is all that's needed for someone to become a Christian. In other words, like it's good to learn things like apologetics. If you've ever heard that term before, all that is, is, is being able to defend the Christian faith against objections that are thrown against it. But like you understand, having a perfect answer to every objection doesn't necessarily guarantee that someone will change from a rejecter of Jesus to a follower of Jesus. And that's because it's possible to know everything that there is to know about the Bible and Jesus and the gospel and yet not have repentance saving faith. All right, like you understand, like there are biblical scholars. They read the Bible in the original languages and they know all kinds of things about Jesus and what he's teaching in the gospels, and yet they don't believe. They don't love Christ. And the reason is because ultimately the final obstacle to our faith is not just in our heads, but in our hearts. Our obstacles are not just intellectual, but volitional. And that's what parables help us see. That for many, parables conceal truths more than they reveal them. They've already rejected Jesus, and Jesus doesn't entertain them with these precious truths of the kingdom. Instead, he reserves them for his people. So again, parables conceal so many truths uh, for many, but not everyone. Not everyone. In fact, to the disciples, Jesus looks at them and says, no, to you, the truths of the kingdom of heaven have been given. And so you are blessed. You're blessed because you hear, because you see, because you understand. And so again, this section reminds us both of the need for divine revelation and the gracious illuminating work of God that he's provided through his spirit. And again, the Bible teaches that before we come to faith in Christ beforehand, we are spiritually dead in our sins. And this is what Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. He says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Again, writing to these believers in Ephesus, he says, this is who we were before our faith. We weren't spiritually injured. We weren't spiritually disabled. We were dead. Spiritually dead. And the question is then, how do we become alive? Like, how can we know and love the Lord when we're spiritually dead? What that means is that we need the supernatural work of the Spirit to make us alive and responsive to Christ. This is what Paul says going on in chapter 2, verse 4. He says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And he's raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He says, you are dead, but God who is rich in mercy has made you alive. He's given you ears to ear, eyes to see, and a heart to love Jesus Christ. In fact, this is exactly what God promises in the Old Testament, in the New Covenant. In Ezekiel, through his prophet, he says to them, I'll give you a new heart. And a new spirit I'll put within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Then in the gospel, God looks at graciously, he looks on spiritually dead people and by his grace, he brings us back to life. And when he brings us back to life, our our minds and our hearts do the very thing that they were created to do, which is to know and love Jesus. I mean, that's the gracious work of God in salvation. And, And so for the Christian who's had that experience, that gracious work of the Spirit in your life, 
this truth really ought to make us a few things. And I think, first of all, it should make us humble, shouldn't it? It should humble us. Because again, the truth is none of us are, uh, came to believe in Jesus because we were smarter than someone else. It isn't because we solved some kind of like Christian riddle or, or we cracked the Jesus code, right? And, and everybody else is on the outside looking in just thinking, man, how did they do it? How did they figure it out? And, and so there's no room for boasting. There's no room for arrogance in the kingdom because we're all here solely by the gracious invitation and enabling of the king of the kingdom. I mean, God has just been so abundantly gracious to us and that's all. And that's incredibly humbling. It should, it should humble us, but it should also make us grateful, shouldn't it? I mean, again, where would you be if it weren't for the gracious work of the spirit to replace your heart of stone with a heart of flesh and allow you to know, understand, and believe the gospel message? Well, the answer is you and I would have remained dead in our sins and trespasses. But God, who's rich in mercy, made you and I alive in Christ. I mean, to you, the truths of the kingdom have been revealed. And you know, God has, was under no on the obligation to do that for you or to do that for me, but he did. I mean, how grateful we should be that he didn't leave us in our state of rebellion and arrogance. How grateful we should be. But I think also it should make us hopeful. The truth should make us hopeful. We should be hopeful for those around us who don't yet know and love Jesus. But you understand salvation isn't, or evangelism isn't us and Jesus just trying to convince people to make the right choice. We're certainly trying to be persuasive and convincing. We want to do that. But salvation is God making dead people come to life. And God's done it a million times. And he continues to do it today. So that person in your life that, that you feel like is just so far gone is not beyond the ability of God to give the truths of the kingdom. To bring back to life. So be hopeful. Pray. Trust. And it should make us humble or hopeful in our evangelism, right? Like, like it should take some weight off uh, of our shoulders as to what's our responsibility and to what isn't our responsibility. It's like, for example, I can deliver a message, right? Like I can try to persuade, I can answer objections to Christianity the best that I'm equipped to. I, I can try to demonstrate a life that's been changed by the gospel as a testimony to God's work to those outside of the kingdom. But I can't bring the dead back to life. I can't cure any kind of spiritual sensory malfunction in others. Like that's beyond mine and your ability, but it's not beyond God's. And he takes full responsibility for it. And in fact, notice how Paul describes this in 2 Corinthians 4, one of my favorite passages in the New Testament, when he says in verse 6, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul says, this is what salvation is. This is what conversion is. That God, the one who created the heavens and the earth, who spoke and light shone in the darkness, is not just the creator, but he's also the new creator. That he speaks and, and light shines in our minds and our hearts, again, to see his glory in the face of his son, Jesus Christ. Paul says, this is the miraculous work of conversion. And God does that and not you and me. In fact, notice what Paul says in the very next verse, verse seven. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Now what's the treasure there? Well, the gospel message, the truth of Christ. What are jars of clay? Well, in the first century, they were the, the common, everyday, disposable household container, right? Like today, think of like a Ziploc bag, right? That the gospel is treasure. And in comparison to the gospel treasure, you and I are the simple containers. And yet, God has chosen to use you and me as simple and unimpressive as we are to bring the treasure of his message to others, giving life to those whom he chooses all that he might receive the glory and not us. And so be hopeful. 
Be hopeful that your unsaved loved one or your unsaved acquaintance or your colleague will one day turn in faith to Christ. Be hopeful that God can and will use you and all of your weaknesses and shortcomings to bring the message of the gospel to those who will believe. This is what this section reminds us of when we talk about parables. And the disciples are like, man, Jesus, why why are you doing this? Again, parables reveal far more than just Jesus' teaching ability. It certainly does that, but far more. The use of parables reminds us of our need for divine revelation and the gracious work of God in providing it for us who believe. Again, we're humbled and we're grateful and we're hopeful. Again, he gave so many parables through his teaching ministry. Most of the time through his words, he, he described this revolutionary way of the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus also gave us some parables that were more visual in nature, like communion. In fact, communion or the Lord's Supper it has actually been called an acted parable. Uh, because when Jesus established it uh, with his disciples on the night of his arrest, he, he did more than just explain what his death would mean through his words. Right? He took bread and he took wine. And, and like so many parables before that night, Jesus lays the common everyday items alongside these incredible spiritual truths. So Jesus holds up the bread. He says, this is my body. Take and eat it. And he holds up a cup filled with wine. He says, this is my blood. Take and drink it. And, and through this acted parable, Jesus doesn't perform some kind of um, a miracle where he changes the elements into his body and blood, but, but he uses them to teach his disciples of his sacrificial death on their behalf. And, and he calls the church from then on to partake time and time again, that we can be reminded, that we can experience this parable over and over again, reminding of his sacrifice until he returns. That even though we were dead, in our sin and our trespasses, Jesus lived the life perfect life we never could. And he went to the cross to take our, pen, uh, our, our sin penalty, our sin debt, and he rose to new life and will one day come again. And those who trust in Christ, who've turned from their sin, who've turned from their self-righteousness and put their faith in Christ and Christ alone are united to him forever. And so we celebrate that as a church this morning. And, and so we do that with joy. And, and if you're a Christian this morning, you, again, you've done that. You've put your faith in Christ. You are welcome to partake this morning, partake in this acted parable. But if you're not a Christian, we're, we're so glad you're here. We're glad you're here. But we would encourage you not to partake this morning because when we do this, we're, we're identifying with Christ. We're acting in this parable when we eat the bread and drink the juice together.